Your patient has come for her first prenatal visit at 10 weeks. She is having a previous, no, not her, her, her friend. Okay, her friend had a fetus with Down syndrome. She is concerned about her own risk of a baby with same disorder. Which test will you offer her? Can you tell me? Okay, which test will you offer her? Or you don't need to offer anything. So, please remember, down screening should be offered to all pregnant women. Okay, so this should be offered to all pregnant women. But which one are you going to tell her to get done now? Commit your answer quickly. Everybody, please commit your answer. So, what is the answer to this question? So, as I see, all of you are typing your answers and I am really happy about that. I am going to disclose the answer now. The answer is not D, it is C. Okay, the answer is C. Can you tell me in which trimester is your patient? She is in the first trimester. What are the tests available in the first trimester? So, one test is dual test, right? And one test is ultrasound for NT. And we are going to combine the two because that has higher sensitivity. So, when you combine the two, this is what is called as combined test. So, combined test is a test of first trimester, right? And we include both in this because it becomes a test with higher sensitivity, okay? So, now what is included in the dual test? So, in the dual test, it is going to be HCG and PAP-A. This is also done between 11 to 13 weeks. What are the findings if the risk is increased? So, risk is increased in the patient if HCG is higher than expected and PAP-A is less than expected, right? So, why is the answer not triple and quadruple test? Why are they incorrect answers? Because triple and quadruple test are done in the second trimester, okay? So, it is done in the second trimester, all right? And when you talk about second trimester, yes, these can be done anywhere between 15 to 22 weeks. Anywhere between 15 to 22 weeks, the triple and the quad test, right? What are the markers of the quad? HCG, alpha fetoprotein, UE3 and inhibin A. Triple has HCG, has alpha fetoprotein, has UE3 but does not have inhibin A. HCG and inhibin A will be higher than expected while alpha fetoprotein and UE3 will be less than expected. Yes? Clear to everyone? Okay. So, you know what to do. If you've done it right, give your score a tick mark. If wrong, genuinely give it a cross. Don't worry. The idea is to keep improving and to keep learning. Are you ready for the next question, everyone? Okay. Your patient is a case of G3 and P0 and L0, right? Now, she has had three consecutive abortions in the first trimester. As a part of evaluation of this problem, which test is most appropriate? Yes, tell me. NT can be done anywhere beyond 10 weeks, bacha. Okay, NT can be done anytime at and beyond 10 weeks. The best time is 11 to 13 plus 6. Also, even if she comes at 10, you don't have to do the test right now. You have to plan it and you have to plan the best test for her. Okay, so we are going to do a combined test. Yes, so commit your answer everybody. Very good. The answer to the question is chromosomal analysis. Okay, why is the answer not HCG? Uh, sorry, HSG. 
So please remember, HSG is a screening test for malarian anomalies or for uterine anomalies. But you have to know that uterine anomalies usually do not cause first trimester RPL. Uterine anomalies more commonly and characteristically cause second trimester recurrent pregnancy losses. Right? Okay. Why is the answer not cervical length? The reason is same. I just told you in a previous question that cervical incompetence will cause only and only second trimester RPL. Right? Why not endometrial biopsy? So, endometrial biopsy can pick up what? It can pick up luteal phase defect. But is luteal phase defect an established cause of RPL? No. So, luteal phase defect is not a established cause of RPL. Okay? So, it is not an established cause of RPL, right? So, please remember the most common cause of RPL in first trimester becomes chromosomal abnormalities. So, when you talk about first trimester RPL, it is more likely to be chromosomal. Can you tell me which chromosomal? Is it going to be aneuploidy? No. So, within chromosomal, it is more likely to be balanced Robertsonian translocations. Okay. So, balanced Robertsonian translocations. Okay. Quickly tell me, do infections cause RPL? No. So, please remember, none of the infections, infections do not, not torch, not syphilis. So, infections do not cause RPL. Okay, somebody is talking about APLA. Please remember, beta, APLA also more characteristically causes second trimester RPL. Okay, so APLA also more commonly causes second trimester recurrent pregnancy losses. Okay, clear to everybody? All right, let's go further. Are you ready for the next question? The next question on your screens is here now. A woman undergoes sonographic evaluation for a uterine size date discrepancy. Okay. Her amniotic fluid index turns out to be 36. Is it more? Yes. The image uh, is shown below. Which of the following is appropriate for her evaluation? Right? Now tell me, does this patient have polyhydramnios? Yes, I can see all of you are already answering. So, the baby or this patient has polyhydramnios. Who is going to tell me what is the cause of polyhydramnios here? The cause in this patient is double bubble sign, right? And double bubble sign is characteristic of what? It is characteristic of duodenal atresia, right? So, it is characteristic of duodenal atresia. Now comes the clinical application. The radiologist has diagnosed duodenal atresia. What should the clinician do? You have to know. That duodenal atresia has a strong association with Down syndrome. Okay, so it has a strong association with Down syndrome and therefore this patient must undergo amniocentesis to look for Downs. But why amniocentesis? Why not chorionic villus sampling? Who is going to give me that reason? Because the patient is in the second trimester. Yes, why is she in the second trimester? Because anomaly scan, where you pick up anomalies, right? 
because anomaly scan is done in the second trimester. So, you have picked up an anomaly. Now, you will do amniocentesis. Remember, amniocentesis can be done any time beyond 15 weeks. Most commonly done between 16 to 18 weeks. Who is going to quickly tell me what is early amniocentesis? Early amniocentesis is when you do it between 11 to 14 weeks. Early amnio is not done in modern obstetrics because it has a high fetal loss rate. Right? So, because early amnio has high fetal loss rate, we don't do it in modern obstetrics. We will only do it beyond 15 weeks. So, at and beyond 15 weeks. Okay? Good to go everybody? Okay. Are you ready for the next question? So, it's a big one. Let me quickly read it for you. Your patient, a case of primary infertility has conceived with assisted reproductive techniques, is coming with right lower abdominal pain and bleeding. She complains of feeling dizzy and her abdomen is tender, there is guarding, there is rigidity. Okay? Her UPT is positive. What is the management? Chalo. Everybody quickly commit your answer so that we can move on to the two last questions of the day. Everybody commit your answer. Okay. So, I have already highlighted the keywords for you. I want you to connect the dots. So, now, yes, I can see most of you are answering. The answer to this question is laparotomy. The answer to this question is C. Now, let us see why. What are you dealing with here? You are dealing with ectopic pregnancy. Which type of ectopic are you dealing with? Ruptured. How do you know it is ruptured? Can you tell me how do you know it is ruptured? Because the patient has a uh, number one postural or orthostatic hypotension. Okay. See, she feels dizzy while standing but better on lying. So, she has orthostatic hypotension. Second, she has tender guard abdomen which is showing us guarding and rigidity. Although her vitals are stable as of now, but still despite they have given you a blood pressure of 100 by 60, these things tell you that you are dealing with ruptured ectopic, right? Now, when it is ruptured ectopic and we have obvious signs of peritonitis. Can you see this? So, we have obvious signs of peritonitis. If you have obvious signs of peritonitis, is there any role of fast? No. Fast is done when patient has unstable vitals and no obvious signs of peritonitis. Okay? Is that clear? Then, can I do serial HCG? No, we never do serial HCG once it is uh, showing us what? Once it is showing us a ruptured ectopic signs. Why not IV fluids and medical management? So, IV fluid is fine. You have to begin resuscitation. Okay? So, you have to begin resuscitation. But, but what is the problem? You cannot do medical management. Okay? You cannot do medical management. Is that clear to everyone? Okay? So, uh, generally, we say unstable when systolic is less than 90, right? So, this patient as of now on lying down is showing us a BP of 100 by 60. Although when she stands, as I said, there is a definite evidence of orthostatic hypotension, okay? So, now 
the answer cannot be medical management because it is ruptured. So, the answer is laparotomy. Who is going to tell me what are we going to do on the fallopian tubes? What treatment are you going to give for this patient? Is it going to be a salpingostomy or a salpingectomy? So, please remember, it has to be salpingectomy. Once you say it is a ruptured ectopic, please do not go and mark ostomy. It has to be a jectomy. Is that clear? Please don't do this mistake. Don't go and mark ostomy. Okay, is that clear to everyone? Perfect. Very good. So, if you have done it right, give yourself a tick. We move on to the second last question of the day. Your patient is a primary gravida. She has come for her first antenatal visit. She is 12 weeks by LMP. She reports vaginal bleeding and the uterus is 16 weeks in size. You are unable to detect fetal heart tone with Doppler. Right? Which of the following will best describe the diagnosis? Okay? Commit your answers quickly. Which of the following best describes the diagnosis? So now, what are we dealing with? A uterine size more than POG. Yes, a uterine size more than POG. No fetal heart rate, which means we are likely dealing with molar. Right? So we are likely dealing with Complete molar pregnancy. So, if it is complete molar, right, what would be the karyotype? 46XX. Yes, 46XX. This is not likely to be a partial mole. A partial mole will usually have a fetus. But even then, option A is wrong because partial mole is not 46XX. What is partial mole? Partial mole is 64, sorry, what is the karyotype? Yes, they are going to be triploid. Yes, they are going to be triploid. So, 69 XXY is the most common karyotype of partial mole. Okay? Older age is not a risk factor, is absolutely wrong. Age more than 40 and even age less than 20 and typically 18 are very important risk factors for ectopic pregnancy. Oh, sorry, for molar pregnancy. So, extremes of age is an important risk factor. Vaginal bleeding is a common symptom. The answer is true. In fact, the most common symptom is vaginal bleeding. Okay, so the most common symptom is vaginal bleeding and when they bleed, they will usually bleed in the second trimester. But when we ask you molar is most commonly diagnosed in, then the answer is first trimester. Why? Because we are now doing routine first trimester ultrasounds for almost all the patients. Right? So, these days we are diagnosing it even before they start to bleed. Okay? Why is option D wrong? Hysterectomy is contraindicated. It is not contraindicated. Hysterectomy will be done when the patient is more than 40 years. She has a complete mole and the family is complete. Okay? And the family is complete. That's when we do a hysterectomy as the main treatment. Otherwise, in general, what is the treatment of choice for molar pregnancy? So, in general, the treatment of choice for molar is suction and evacuation. Okay, this brings us to the last question of the day. Everyone ready for your scores as well? Let's do this. Oh, oh no answer. Okay. Your patient has undergone a suction evacuation. 
Her pathology reveals a hydropic degeneration with absence of villi and no fetal tissue. Her chest x-ray is normal. Which of the following is the next step in her management? Chalo, quickly everyone commit your answers. What is the answer? So, what are you dealing with? You are again dealing with a case of molar. Which one? Again, complete mole. Why? Because this is the characteristic histopath finding of complete mole. So, this is how we integrate basic sciences with clinical sciences. Right? You will see a complete hydropic degeneration of the villi. Right? Not only this, we will see a complete hydropic degeneration and the villi are avascular. And there is no fetus. What else is the finding? Extensive trophoblastic proliferation. Right? So, extensive trophoblastic proliferation. So, these are characteristic histopath findings of complete mole. So, because she is a molar pregnancy, now I have to follow up after suction evacuation. And how do we do the follow up? So, this is how we make the question clinical now. The follow up has to be weekly until three consecutive normal values. Right? So, I will do weekly follow up till I get three consecutive normal values. Uske baat kya karte hai? Monthly follow up. And what is the total duration of surveillance? So, total duration of surveillance in complete mole is 6 months. Right? So, the answer is surveillance for 6 months. And the most important advice for the patient is not to conceive in these 6 months. So, remember, what is the contraception of choice? OCP. And which contraceptive method to be avoided? Intrauterine device. Right? Because then she will bleed and we will think she has converted into neoplasia. We can't do a hysterectomy because she is 19 years old. We can't give her any kind of chemo because she is not a high-risk patient. Who is a high-risk patient? A high-risk patient is a woman who is more than 40 years old. She has uterine size more than POG. She has HCG more than 10 to the power 5. She has bilateral theca lutein cyst. So, only if my patient is high risk, only then she receives prophylactic chemo. Otherwise, we don't give chemo to all patients, only to high risk patients. The drug of choice is again methotrexate. So, this is called as selective chemotherapy in high risk patients. Yes, everybody clear with the concepts? So, do you see how many things we integrated? We did ectopic, we did molar, we did um, abortions, we did congenital anomalies, we did Down syndromes, we did teratogenicity, uh, we also did uh, level 2 and complicated findings and integration. So, do you see how many things can come under one spectrum? So, if you start connecting the dots, various topics will be integrated and this is what is the next pattern, integration. Horizontal integration, vertical integration, right? I personally think this makes uh, subjects even more interesting where you can connect the dots between basic sciences and your clinical subjects. So, did you all enjoy today's session? Good night, take care and as usual, I definitely want to say thank you so much for making me a part of your journey. Lots and lots of good wishes, lots of love. Take care of yourself, keep smiling and don't worry about the exam pattern. Okay, take care.